Thank you. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Welcome. Uh, I'm Bahira Trask, and I'm on the East Coast of the United States. I'm a professor and chair of human development at fa uh, of family sciences at the University of Delaware. And I'm delighted to see all of you. And I would like to thank Ignacio and Alex and the IFFD for inviting me and the panel to run this focus group. What I would like to do is each of you take one or two minutes to introduce yourselves so that everybody get to know each other. And then we've been given a list of eight questions, which I'm sure you've seen. I have been asked to help keep each of you at a two minute uh, a time limit. And so if you could address the questions and also be thinking about recommendations. My understanding is that the IFFD is pulling us together to start to be thinking about the agenda for 2324, which is the uh, International Year of Families Plus 30. Mm -hmm. And for those of you who are not familiar with these decade celebrations, it's usually yeah. one year of activities in different parts of the world, all with the mission to help strengthen and support families and to really bring families to the center of the discussion. So I will just call on you based on how you are on my screen. I hope this is okay with everybody. And I'd like to start with Livia Ola. And it says on my screen, you are on Stockholm at Stockholm University in Sweden. Welcome. Yes, thank you very much. And thank you uh, for IFFD for the invitation. Uh, I am Livia Ola, uh, Associate Professor at the Department of Sociology, Stockholm University. I'm a demographer and uh, also a gender scientist. So I pass on to the next person. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. Uh, Wilhelm Adema, OECD. Hi there, I'm Willem Adema uh, from the OECD Social Policy Division. Uh, I have been working with a team on, uh, of analysts on uh, gender, family and housing issues uh, for uh, the most recent past. I started with this work uh, back in oh, the late 90s with work on the babies and bosses, uh, work and family reconciliation reviews. And I've seen many of you at, at conferences, uh, et cetera. Uh, I'm delighted uh, to participate. I'm very thankful for the invitation. But unfortunately, I had a, um, a pre-existing commitment. So I have to, uh, to go elsewhere at 3 o'clock. But thank you for having me. Welcome. And if you have some recommendations you want to get in before you go, then we'll go a little bit out of order just with that. So thank you. Uh, Erika Kommissar, please. I also want to thank you for the invitation to participate today. I'm Erika Kommissar. I'm a psychoanalyst based in New York City. My specialty is parent guidance. Um, I, I'm an author. I write books. I also write for various publications such as the Wall Street Journal, and I'm a contributing editor to the Institute for Family Studies in America. Welcome. Thank you. Ahmed, Ahmed, good to see you. <laughs> Good to see you, Bahira, um, and I'm Ahmed Arif, uh, Planning and Content Manager at the Doha International Family Institute. Uh, DFI is a member of uh, Qatar Foundation, as you know. Uh, I would like to thank you, uh, Ignacio, um, IFFD, the, uh, Alex, for this kind of invitation. And uh, I'm sure with the outstanding uh, moderation of uh, Bahira, we will get uh, some uh, concise outcomes. My expertise uh, is, is uh, intersected between family, labor, and social policies, with a particular focus on social inclusion, exclusion, and uh, demography. Thank you. Welcome. Francesco Bilari from Milano. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so I'm professor of demography at Bocconi University in Milan, uh, and I also chair the consortium board of the Generations and Gender Program. Uh, we have worked on uh, family and fertility for a number of years, uh, in mostly with a European focus, but let's say in general, looking at the evolution of families and, and fertility. And, and I'm, I'm very proud to be here, and I thank the uh, IFFD and uh, Bahira for sharing this. So I look forward to uh, this discussion. Wonderful. And Jean Jung? 
Uh, good evening. <laughs> I guess for many of you, it's good morning or good afternoon. Uh, I'm Jean Yang. I'm a professor at the National University of Singapore. And uh, I'm with the sociology department and the Center for Family and Population Research. Um, I'm a family demographer um, and I work on stratification as well. Um, I've worked on a variety of uh, family demographic um, topics uh, such as fertility, marriage, and more recently, you know, productive aging issues. Uh, so uh, I'm very grateful that you include me in this dialogue. Thank you. Welcome. Yes, by us, it's morning. So you are a whole half day ahead. Yeah, yeah. seven hours difference. I yeah. think. So um, I will, what will, how we'll start is we'll go through the questions. I'll start with the questions and then we'll just go again based on my screen. I hope that that's okay. And uh, like I said, I was given the directive two minutes per participant. So the first question is, will investing in education and health for all, including lifelong learning, help to improve productivity and maintain economic growth even as the share of the working age population shrinks. Now, I know this is a huge issue, especially in the high income countries. So why don't we start with, why don't we start with Jean? Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Um, the answer is yes. I, I think, um, especially in a rapidly aging society where uh, there is um, the, the society is struggling with the shrinking working age population. Um, one of the more promising developmental strategy is in fact to invest on human capital. And the most important thing is two components of human capital is education and health. Um, with education and health, then it gives people resources to draw on and empower them to seek solutions for problems and allows them to bounce back more uh, from the adversity faster and work smarter, come up with uh, innovation solutions. So these abilities make people more productive and uh, maybe motivated and in innovative, which will help with uh, economic growth, um, even if the share of the working age population shrinks. Every person's uh, productivity uh, can increase uh, because of lifelong learning um, at different life stages. So I'll stop at that. Thank you, Jean. Uh, William? I fully support that. The answer to this question is, uh, is certainly yes. And I would like to raise um, two issues here, which I think are of particular importance. Um, education, early childhood education and care and the quality thereof uh, is the foundation for future life chances. And uh, so I think it's very important that governments across the globe uh, pay uh, attention to that, because <clears throat> not only um, uh, increases it uh, individual skills, it reduces risks of, fam uh, of families and children that they uh, grow up in poverty. So I think this is a very important issue. The other uh, thing which is raised here, and that is that would also be one of my uh, recommendations, is that our um, demographic um, trend are such that uh, population, particularly in more wealthy countries, OECD countries, are aging rapidly. And we're currently undertaking a family policy review of Norway. And the issues around elderly care services will become in, uh, increasingly important. And one of the bottlenecks already is um, the finding uh, skilled uh, carers uh, to help with the provision of these services. We can look ahead, we can see it coming, we can prepare, we should invest more in uh, the provision of the, uh, and the provision of high quality services. Thank you. I couldn't agree more. Yes, having just had two elderly parents. So thank you. Ahmed. So uh, like my colleagues, uh, you know, the answer is uh, certainly yes. 
uh, I will refer to the uh, OECD definition of human capital because the question talks about education and health. Both education and health are foundational uh, pillars for larger uh, kind of umbrella of human capital, which is according to the OECD, uh, knowledge, skills, competences, and health embodied together in people. So like the physical machineries, you know, uh, also human capital can be accumulated and without investing in, in proper education, health, uh, the, 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 the economy at large will not, you know, sustain and will not uh, be, be developing. And here also, I would like to emphasize that in addition to investing in, you know, education and health, the investment in the larger kind of context is very important. You can educate a girl, but if you don't enable her with the uh, skills to be, uh, you know, active member in the labor force, uh, education itself is not a standalone kind of uh, target. So uh, certainly, yes, uh, the, emphasis, the emphasis should be in addition to education and health, to uh, the enabling context and environment as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, very important. Francesca. Thank you. Uh, since is, this is the first answer, I will try to have a more general answer than just this question. Uh, the simple answer is uh, yes, but it will not be sufficient. The more elaborate answer is that demographic change is uh, slow, as uh, we witness in terms of predictability of aging. And in that sense, to tackle slow challenges, investing now will lead to uh, advantages in the medium and long term. And so it is crucial to do that. However, demographic change is also fast in, in the sense that we also need uh, maybe to maintain productivity and economic growth now or in the next five to 10 years. And in that sense, investment in education and health may not necessarily be the solution. Actually, in some cases, uh, it may also backfire. So we need to take into account the dual speed of demography. So we need to invest for the long term for slow demography, but it will not be sufficient to counter uh, declines in productivity linked to declines in labor force uh, to maintain economic growth in the demographic short term. But the demographic short term is very important because we are talking of the next 10, 15 years. So in an economic perspective, the demographic short term is sort of the long economic term. So we have to tackle these two speeds of demography simultaneously. For one of them, it is crucial to invest in education and health. For the other one, it's not sufficient. Thank you. I'll go back to these topics. Later. I was going to say, I think we will all want you to go back and see what you are thinking, where the investments should be. So thank you very much. Erika, please. Yes, my concern is that we are very focused on the term economic growth. And even though economic growth in the short term, we know is a very important thing. I'm concerned that we are short-sighted when we talk about economic growth and we're not thinking holistically about family needs and mental health. So my specialty is mental health. And so obviously there is a lot of um, productivity that's tied to mental health and mental illness. And um, you know, my concern is that when we think about getting as many people into the workforce as possible, we're not really considering the needs of very young children. Again, my specialty is, uh, is really the neuroscience of attachment. And um, in the first three years, it's very important to keep at least one attachment figure as close to a developing uh, child as possible. And I think that we are, um, as a society, not focused on prevention of mental illness, which has very long-term implications for society economically and um, you know, emotionally, in terms of physical health, we know that mental health uh, and mental illness is tied to physical illness. Um, and so I, I, my concerns are that you know, as, a society, as societies, we're very concerned about the present and getting as many people into the workforce and not really concerned about 
who's caring for the developing right brains of children between the ages of zero and three? Thank you very much. And I, I think what you just raised is super important. And hopefully after we go through our questions, we can come back to this. But also economic growth is one thing in terms of numbers, but people's well-being and how they are being quote unquote used in the workforce is, I don't think we discuss that enough. It's one thing to have economic growth, but at what cost to human lives and family lives in particular. So let's come back to that a very important point. Thank you for raising it. And uh, please, Livia. Yes, thank you very much. I certainly support uh, the people who have been speaking before me. At the individual level, uh, definitely uh, we see, uh, or we might see both positive and negative aspects of education. When we look at the societal level, uh, I see rather a more positive aspect and a, a higher productivity. And I would like to refer to uh, Professor Wolfgang Lutz and colleagues. Uh, they have clearly shown that um, even though there is a concern, if we just uh, look at the age dependency ratio, the number of people who are getting older versus the number of people who are there to support them in, in the age structure, that certainly doesn't look so nice, but if we take into account that uh, younger generations are more educated it, uh, and also the more educated people are staying longer in the labor force, they are more productive, then actually the equation looks better. So uh, investing in education at the societal level, that certainly will be a high level of payoff. And we have seen good examples such as Singapore, South Korea and China with rapid economic uh, growth and high living standard, uh, thanks to their investment in education. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. And a theme I heard was really investing in early childhood. I heard that from several of you. But I, again, for the discussion, I want us to be thinking about investments in youth as well. So because there are a lot of issues around the world with young people being now in the most vulnerable jobs. They're the first, they're not able to get employment, they're laid off, etc. But I will save that for our discussion. The second question is, how does promoting gender equality in employment and adopting family-friendly policies improve labor force participation and sustain higher levels of economic activity and well-being? And Erica, since you started off on the mental health uh, track, I th thought maybe we can start with you for this question. You know, the ties between stress over loss of employment and stress over work family balance rests mostly, most heavily on women. Um, and I, I always say that gender equality is not that we have to do the same work, but that we be valued equally for the work we choose to do. So one of the concerns I have is that we value unpaid caregiving as real work, that it's not fair that women do the lion's share of caregiving in society, but are not recognized for their quote unquote invisible work, um, that they become visible to society as valuable and remunerated so they don't face poverty later in life. Um, I think COVID has amplified this in that, you know, more women in all over the world, really, I have statistics here, have really lost their employment uh, during COVID because child care rested mostly on them. Um, and, and I'm very keen that COVID, and I write articles about this, that COVID has also offered families an opportunity um, to have a different perspective on child care and caregiving and to actually appreciate the value of be, having at least one parent home with their child. So for me, I think, um, you know, sometimes it's the father today who is the primary attachment figure, but it's, it's really critical that we um, think about, you know, who is caring for children and are we valuing the work of caregiving, not just of children, but also of our elderly and our sick, um, that caregiving is really an undervalued, um, undervalued profession, if you will. Thank you very much. And you're 100% right. I've also seen all those statistics on what has happened during COVID. A lot of things were just right under the table and people didn't recognize it. They thought we've made quote unquote more progress than we have. So thank you. Uh, William, please. Thank you. Um, 
when, when we first started to think uh, more than 20 years ago about uh, work and family reconciliation, I mean, uh, the real driver there is, is both economic uh, aspects, but also individual aspirations and thereby uh, individual well-being and when it concerns a household, family well-being. And to find a better balance in that, uh, therefore, has positive effects on well-being on labor supply, on economic growth, uh, and um, the sustainability thereof. That was the main driver. Uh, does it always work out? It depends um, on individuals, but it also depends very much on the policies that support uh, such a stance and the labor market regulations that uh, prevail in a country. And by and large, in many OECD countries, um, dual earner families uh, have become normal, so to speak, have become the norm. And uh, the, the traditional pattern of a man uh, working and uh, uh, the mother staying at home has been uh, often replaced. COVID was a very interesting experience in the sense that it opens uh, up the eyes of many workers, but also employers to the um, to future work patterns that may become more normal as well, uh, allowing workers uh, to spend more time at home uh, and more time with their families. Um, so that may have, in the end, a positive impact on well-being. Mm -hmm. I think that's a wonderful answer. It goes back to our other discussion about economic growth. And I've seen that in several sectors that the employers are completely flabbergasted that people want to be at home. They're like, they thought everybody owes it to them to work all the time and not at home. So thank you. Ahmed, please. Um, uh, I'm, you know, uh, stressing on what uh, William just highlighted, because when the, the concept of, of work family balance started, the employers, you know, was hesitant to take such kind of uh, policy frameworks yep. because they see the, the rational at the end is, you know, family will being and individual lives. But the vast majority of evidence, particularly during COVID-19, proved that family friendly workplace policies not only affecting positively the individual well-being, but also it is impacting positively the productivity. And it has a, a, a very positive also consequences at the economic level. Here, I, I would just, you know, also to highlight the issue of um, absent fatherhood in, in some of the contexts and how uh, family-friendly workplace policies are very important to emphasize and to nudge shared responsibilities at home. And I will give just one example of Iceland, for instance, because the question talks about the, the contribution of such policies to the gender equality. And we all know that Iceland is the top in the gender equality index. But they, they promoted this kind of uh, shared responsibility set of policies like the parental leave. And you know the parental leave was uh, nine months, can be divided between the father and mother, and when they found through impact assessment tools that the, the, this, this kind of policy is very effective in promoting gender equality and even in sustaining fertility rates in the country, they uh, extended the leave from nine months to 12 uh, months. So these kind of best practices, I think we are, uh, you know, in a position like in, in, in our think tanks and policy uh, hubs to nudge policymakers for such changes. Again, I think this is really interesting, but it, it, the work needs to get out outside of uh, academia and also policy. It also needs to go out to civil society and the people who actually run businesses. So, because they don't, my experience is they don't always believe this. So, because we have a model in place that you should push people the most, you know, to produce. At least I'm living in America, so this is the model here. <laughs> yeah, let me, if I take just 30 seconds, uh, yeah. just to, yeah. uh, you know, comment. Yeah. We in DFI also help with the private sector in, in, in developing such a set of policies. So we have one telecommunication uh, company in, in the country, 
and we uh, you know offer them kind of uh, expertise and framework related to flexible working arrangements and they adopt it so it is yes it is uh, uh, the the responsibility of think tanks is to go outside the the uh, academia and reach out to the private sector and ngos perfect that's perfect that's exactly the kind of model i had in my head also thank you francesco please thank you uh if I start from the previous question, investing in education for all means investing in education for men and women, for girls and boys. So the, the long term implication of equal education is kind of equal or similar participation in the labor market and in care work. We have to take that into account as a slow development, which is an unavoidable consequence of the idea of education for all, which is uh, we, we all very welcome. So once we take that into account, there are two implications. First of all, men and women are entitled to uh, work trajectories that are potentially uh, equal in terms of uh, potential. The second, and this then improves uh, labor force participation by definition. The second point is that it's concerned when being two things from the economic perspective of course for families dual earners tend to give more stability in terms of economic well-being so by definition this is bringing more well-being in terms of challenges however which have already been mentioned and if we get to a broader uh, definition of well-being this kind of gender revolution the uh, basically uh, eruption of women in the labor force and, uh, and reaching a, a, an equal level has not yet been matched by uh, men taking over care work and sharing care work. And so policies have to push the second half of the gender revolution in order to make sure that this is not penalizing families, well-being and fertility, which in the end will have a consequence on demographic change. So all these policies are good for demography, but they need to be stable uh, in order to have effects in the long run. Thank you, absolutely correct. So yeah, and there needs to be, a. I think, I, I work in this area also, so I'm very interested in this, but there needs to be also a redefinition about masculinity, femininity, all of that, because I think for men, it's so tied to economic provision, and that's one of the problems. So, but again, we can discuss this further. Jean, please. Uh, yes, I agree with uh, everything that uh, others says. I guess I would just add that, uh, you know, promoting gender equality in employment, um, will make people not worry so much about losing their jobs or having a high opportunity cost of getting married or having a baby um, and in terms of losing their potential wage or uh, being passed over for advancement opportunities. Um, so men and women can be more focused and less stressed um, on the jobs, at, uh, but that's not, import, uh, that's not sufficient by itself. Um, gender inequality, gender equality needs to be paired uh, or complemented uh, with the uh, family friendly policies. So if a woman are working, they need not to worry about uh, how their babies are doing. So quality, uh, child care, um, you know, parental leave, flexible work arrangements, these will all help. I think not just economic activities, but people, more, more importantly, people's well-being. And also the equality in, at, at the workplace is very closely related to uh, relationship at home. Uh, it would generate a more egalitarian relationship at home. Uh, there will be less stress and conflict at home. That's uh, some of the research had shown. So, so certainly, um, well-being at home, mental health, stress at home uh, will benefit as well. Um, our, my own research actually recently showed that uh, paternity leave helps with family dynamics, benefit the family dynamics. Um, people have higher, or at least a woman, have higher 
um, marital satisfaction. There are fewer conflicts. Um, there, there are just more communication going on. And it also indirectly links to children's uh, test scores and behavioral problem. And I think that's very important. So we're not just talking about economic activity, but um, very importantly, family members' well-being. And of course, that would benefit the society as a whole. Thank you. Wonderful, Jean. Again, for our discussion, I think we should talk, you know, this, this was very interesting to hear about your research. And we know family leave quality childcare flexibility helps families, but it's not being instituted uniformly at all. And so the question is how, as we move forward in the 21st century, how do we, how do we make those changes? So thank you. Uh, Livia, please. Yes, thank you. Um, well, uh, the Icelandic example has been already mentioned, but uh, to be fair, Sweden was the first country in the world introducing a gender equal parental leave, and it has uh, shown uh, to have beneficial effects for families. Uh, among others, also my research has shown that um, in families, when the parents share the parental leave, then uh, they have a higher likelihood to have another child. And these families are also more stable, so they have a reduced risk of separation or divorce. So it's a really family friendly. So gender equality can be really family friendly if we have supportive surroundings. Of course, it's not only about parental leave, they also have to have uh, as it has been already mentioned that gender equality means not only equal labor force participation, but also equal care sharing and uh, sharing of the other tasks. Mm -hmm. So we need uh, proper services also uh, to help uh, parents uh, in, in this uh, uh, important task, of course. But we also have to think actually of lone parents, because we know that uh, we have many who are uh, raising their children alone, at least for certain segments of the children's life. So how we can help uh, them? And we also know that a large percentage of lone parents are actually women. So we need uh, policies that enable them to participate at the labor market because that has been shown that that reduces also child poverty significantly. Uh, if we empower lone mothers to participate in the labor market, they will also have uh, better life satisfaction because people who are economically active, they actually, they, they were shown to be more happy than the unemployed or those who are uh, outside of the labor market. So this might be a very important aspect also. Of, of this question. Thank you. I am so happy you raised single parents because I was thinking about this also, that all the discussions and so many policies always assume there's two people in the house that share all the duties. And for so many people, that is not the case at all. So thank you. And again, we should come back to this and discuss it further. Okay, we'll move to our third question. How can orderly, safe, and regular migration and mobility of people be facilitated in order to ensure that demographic, technological, and climactic reasons won't affect immigrants' well-being? This is a big and complicated topic with many aspects to it and somewhat different from what we were talking about, but I'm actually working on a paper on this, so I have lots of thoughts. Let's start with, who would like to start this? Let's start with Francesca this time. Thank you, difficult question, uh, let me start. Um, okay, I, I go back to the idea of uh, fast and slow change in demography. So the, the first consideration we have to uh, take is uh, that uh, migration is uh, an essential fast component of demographic change. And if you want to uh, keep, for instance, maintain productivity in many uh, countries and societies, it is essential. And so this is the first component. In order to answer positively to the question, we have to understand that we have to be frank with uh, the public opinion, with policymakers. Family policies will not solve demographic problems in the short term. Migration might. So this is the first uh, consideration, a kind of a sort of literacy issue that we have to deal with. 
The second point, and then I also try to get to best practice, is uh, uh, what kind of migration? Uh, I know this is a delicate topic, but in the end, to have a balanced demographic uh, development, migration has to be connected with families. And so thinking that migrants do not have a family uh, which has been uh, a model for many societies uh, is not productive in the long run. We have to understand that migrants mean migrant families and that's positive in the longer term. Uh, and then I end up with an example. The example was an exam a brave example uh, of uh, kind of being alone in the face of political difficulties. And it's Chancellor Merkel in Germany facing the crisis of Syrian refugees around 2015. And she publicly declared that there was no upper limit to the number of uh, refugees Germany would accept. And that year, Germany had uh, one and, basically one and a half million net migrants over a population of 80 million. And there's been lots of investment for uh, these <laughs> refugees uh, and their families to integrate them in the long run. And possibly this will be a, a long-term success story. We still have to look at it, but this is an important uh, policy where you had a strong political leader who wanted to make a point and she didn't lose elections afterwards. Thank you, a wonderful example. Again, very complex issue. So, because not a lot of people in Germany, my, my parents lived in Germany, a lot of people don't agree with the policy. So, thank you. Ahmed. The complexity of this uh, phenomena is, is different really from context to another. So I, I, will, I will talk about this uh, part of the world at the GCC, the Gulf Cooperation Council, where you know labor policies have been a, a rich niche for academic and policy debate. This stems from the fact that labor market structure in the Gulf is distinctive in terms of the massive demographic imbalance between nationals and expats, which is a result of the you know, intense migration to fill in the human capital gap and the development needs. Uh, this abiding and, and structural challenge you know, from the demographic imbalance is also accompanied by a set of other challenges in, in terms of this complexity of, of demography uh, and social labor policies. Because there are other challenges related to cradle to grave the welfare uh, system, the rentier state model in the Gulf. Uh, so all these, you know, contributed to drastic transformation in the past five years in the uh, social demographic and labor policies. So the key solutions uh, we have, you know, noticed in the past five years are, you know, um, the 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 uh, introduction of set of policies to uh, trying to uh, increase or sustain at least the uh, fertility rates among the nationals, particularly reducing the number of low skilled workers by the dependency on new technologies and uh, introduction of the uh, retention policies and more of a social inclusion set of policies for the skilled labor uh, workers and their families. Thank you. Thank you. You raise a very important point about context. Again, something we need to come back to. So, William, please. Thank you. This is one of those issues I'm, I'm not really an expert on. I know a thing or two, but I'm not really an expert on on the complex issue of migration. My, my colleagues working in the migration division of the OECD have far more to say. And I, I um, looked at uh, their recent work and, and picked up one topic, which picks up on, on what Francesco uh, uh, said. I mean, the, the, um, um, the important, there's an important aspect of family migration uh, in the OECD, but I'm, I'm sure uh, this applies to other countries as well. And, uh, and the well-being and the stability of the primary migrant uh, is much affected by uh, family aggression, migration and whether uh, his family, or because it's most often his family, is willing to, um, is allowed to, to join him. Um, it's an important um, feature. 
if you account for intra-European uh, mobility, it, uh, family migration concerns as much as 2 million people a year. Um, and uh, of course, once uh, family migration has occurred, it's much more likely that the primary migrant uh, will stay in the, um, in, in, in the country of arrival. Um, family migrants often do not as good uh, in their new country as, uh, as other migrants. Um, we think, the OECD thinks that it's important to ease restrictions on family um, unification. It may only de delay the arrival of families. And um, the other thing is, of course, that when families and young children arrive, uh, it is important to help them settle and integrate in the, in, in the country of arrival as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, this is very complicated issue. So because there's the people who migrate permanently versus temporarily. And now we also have a lot of women, particularly from low income countries that are migrating for shorter periods of time, sending back money. This is a very complex issue. And the family piece is usually not discussed in any of these uh, you know, in all of these movements. So, Livia, please. Yes, thank you very much. Um, just speaking about women, I would like to raise the issue of so-called care migration, mm -hmm. or uh, that women who come to highly developed countries usually to take care of the elderly people there, yeah. if uh, there are not uh, sufficient uh, social support systems for elderly care, and in many uh, highly developed societies there are not, but it is still on the shoulder of the family. And uh, if uh, the uh, prime age workers are working, then of course somebody else needs to take care of the elderly. Hence, uh, we are relying in uh, uh, well many countries uh, on uh, in, in Europe, for example, is that are common that uh, Central Eastern European women are taking care of uh, elderly in Germany, Austria, and uh, other <laughs> countries where the social care system is, the public care system is not uh, so well developed. And of course, we have to think of that, uh, who are these women uh, leaving behind? Because often uh, their children, or maybe they have themselves elderly uh, parents, and uh, someone else has to take care uh, of these uh, relatives in, in their own country. So then, of course, the remittances that they are sending back home, it's very important for the family. But the social context uh, is also very important that we have to take into consideration. Thank you. Thank you very much. Erika, please. I have very practical points on this. Um, you know, in terms of um, mental health concerns, there are great mental health concerns of people migrating um, and to reduce some of the, the mental health issues. Um, one is keeping families together. We know that families do better when they migrate together and they stay together. We know that uh, families do better when they have linguistically and culturally appropriate mental health care uh, when they get to their destination we know that they do better when we address the transition of adolescence. So my second book is about adolescence. And um, we know that adolescence is what we call the second critical window of brain development. And it's a very, uh, I think you said earlier, Bahira, that the, um, the concern over youth in the world, it's particularly concerning when you have an adolescent that's displaced into a new uh, country, new culture, that we need to particularly focus on adolescents. Otherwise, there's a very high risk of mental health concerns. Um, we also need to think about what Brian Stevenson said about proximity when we segregate these populations into, uh, you know, into very isolated communities. Uh, it doesn't promote empathy in the communities. So we really need to think about how can we increase the empathy towards these populations and only through integration and integrating them into all communities where there's proximity, as, as Brian Stevenson said. Um, and lastly, uh, I agree with what Livia said about leaving children behind. In certain countries, there is a culture of leaving very young children behind, and that's being discouraged in those countries. They are not giving visas out to women who 
uh, have children under the age of three. And that's a very important thing because <laughs> what it does is it leaves behind um, a trail of emotional disturbance and mental illness. When you, d when you abandon your own children to care for someone else's children in another country, Again, there is the idea of economic development over emotional well-being. Um, so these are some of the things I think about. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And Jean, please. Uh, yes, so I agree this is a very complex issue, but very important issue. Um, I agree with what Francisco says that family policies will not solve the population problem in the short run, but uh, migration might. And so many countries are um, trying to figure out how to do that. And there's competition uh, between countries too about uh, what kind of people uh, they draw in and allow in their uh, borders. Um, there are different kinds of migrants. Uh, some that we have been talking about as more permanent uh, people who become uh, citizen and PR in the long run. And these are mostly the skilled workers, but there are other kinds uh, that are more short-term and transient and are uh, designed to be that way. Um, for instance, Singapore is one of the example of this two-pronged uh, policy of both having uh, highly skilled, talented uh, workers that they need in the industries and also the um, semi-skilled and low-skilled uh, workers like uh, domestic helper, uh, construction workers, uh, these migrant workers who are giving uh, work permit only. You know, they're not expected or allowed to be, to, to be a permanent um, uh, citizen or, or resident in that particular place. And for these kind of... Um, Transient workers, there are a lot of issues that I think we need to be um, uh, concerned about, uh, about their well-being. Um, you know, this, this migrant, in, again, in Singapore, Hong Kong, and uh, other countries where domestic helper um, often are not allowed to come with uh, their, their family. So we've talked about that already there. The mental health, it's not good for their mental health. health. But they're also, uh, their working conditions, uh, and sometimes, and the work hours uh, that they were uh, subjected to on daily basis. Uh, their safety too. Uh, we've heard sexual assault, um, you know, uh, by the owners uh, sometimes, and, um, uh, and uh, government uh, here pays a lot of attention about the health of these um, health work, the, these migrant workers. Um, another very important thing is their visa status that often put them in a very vulnerable uh, place. And sometimes the, the, um, their, their uh, visa got cut off abruptly and they have no choice but to leave right away. And, uh, sometimes they don't get paid uh, in time and so on. So th there's a lot of challenges to um, manage these uh, migrants, both uh, in terms of um, uh, or protect, uh, protect their well-being, both the um, semi-skill and low-skill. And, and I, I think for the higher level of skilled workers, uh, it is the integration that needs to, we need to pay more attention to. Uh, often they're let in, but with uh, language problems and other um, social network problems that uh, the society is not paying attention to and they become isolated. Again, that would not be conducive to um, uh, you know, integration of, uh, for the, the society and um, the, the, the well-being of the, the migrants as well. So there are many of these uh, issues. It's very difficult. And I think um, the government are all very carefully monitoring and calibrate the number and the type of different kinds of migrants that are, um, that are allowed to uh, enter uh, their borders. 
and I think we need to continue to work on this and talk about these issues. Thank you, Jean. And you raise an important point about different kinds of migrants. And so far, we've really only talked about quote unquote voluntary migrants, you know, people yeah. who choose to move due to employment. I hate to put poverty in there, but that's why a lot of people might. What we haven't talked about is involuntary migrants, the ones who have to leave, they have absolutely no choice because of violence, war, or climate change. I recently heard a report that said that in the next 10 years, that's going to be the major push of migrants because so many areas of the world are becoming inhospitable and they cannot earn a living anymore. And there's absolutely no way for them to stay. And all the surrounding countries don't want them. So what happens to all of these people? And it's something we haven't even begin, began to, to grapple with. I'm mindful of the time because I know William needs to leave in a couple of minutes. So again, let's table this and we'll, we, we will have some time for our discussion. And we'll get, I wanna make sure that William gets his, his thoughts in. And William, since this is probably gonna be your last time to participate. Any thoughts you may have, we'll start with you. You can answer any of the questions and then uh, I will have the rest of the group. We can go through the questions as they are written, if that's okay with everyone. Thank you very much. I mean, I, I, I could talk for quite a long while as some of you may know, but I, I, will, I will not do so. I was, there was a couple of things which I um, wrote down and I, I would prioritize, apart from the issues I've already mentioned in terms of investing early in children and preparing uh, for service delivery for the elderly and, and, and the workforce that is required uh, in that regard. Um, it has already been mentioned when you think about health across the life course, um, the current situation, the COVID pandemic, has had significant impact on many groups, uh, but uh, youth are hard hit by this um, uh, pandemic. Um, sitting at home, playing games, uh, lack of social contact outside, lack of uh, personal development, go out in the world and, or just in the community to, to explore. Um, those issues are um, important um, and uh, should be on the forefront uh, of our thinking. How can we help the youth of today uh, to prepare for, for, for working life? How can we um, make this up to them in between, uh, um, yeah, not question marks, but, um, um, and, um, I think that will be a very important issue. Uh, the Dutch have just got a new government. Um, plans to cut back on youth services have been thrown out by Parliament. I think that's a very important step that um, policymakers uh, get to focus on uh, the development of more adequate youth services. So uh, that's an important uh, point. And of course, uh, when it comes to a question for um, prevention is often uh, a lot cheaper than uh, repairing uh, the damage. So uh, as an economist, I would be um, advocating uh, good prevention rather than uh, repair measures. And the other thing which I wanted to say is, um, is related to retirement savings, um, which comes up later on, um, question seven and eight. I think it's important that societies um, develop a good pension system in the sense that it's collectively based and uh, not just based on individual retirement uh, savings. And um, the greater the element of solidarity between the generations, but also between those in richer and poorer income groups, which often overlap with uh, uh, health status, um, is an important element of a sustainable retirement system rather than just focus on individual retirement accounts uh, as, as some policies purport. So I think that is a, a, a very important issue. Um, in terms of social policy, 
poverty alleviation uh, is key, particularly among the, 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 power, the, the poorest countries uh, in the world. When it comes to OECD countries, again, um, it is much uh, more economical to sustain a welfare system which helps people to stay in work for as long as possible. That is good for their well-being, but it's also good for the economic uh, uh, status of a country. And uh, in, in that uh, situation, uh, a supportive uh, social protection system pays off. Um, it was lovely to meet you. It was lovely to meet some others of you. Uh, it was great to see you again, Livia and Francesco and Ahmed. Uh, and I hope to see you uh, again face to face for once uh, at a conference uh, at some point. Uh, it's, it's, it's time to, to get out there again and, and, and talk to people face to face. But it was lovely uh, having this opportunity to to talk to you all. Thank, Thank you very you much. So much. Thank you, William, for all your Thank wonderful you, points. So and it was You're great to meet you. So yes. Thank you. Thank you, you take Thank care. You. And... Thank you. Okay, we will go on. This just to remind you, this was question four. William answered part of it, but we then went on to some of the other questions. In what way promoting lifelong health and preventative care helps to maintain the functional capacity and well-being of individuals through the life cycle? Why don't we start with you, Erika, since this is your area of work and you raised it right from the start. So, so I have, again, very practical tips for this. Um, and I'll just go through some of the things I think about. Um, paid maternity and paternity leave. Um, meaning respect for attachment security as a key to mental health is prevention. Um, it is much less expensive for countries to prevent mental illness than to treat it. And some of these mental illnesses that are related to attachment disorders, um, you know, we're very focused in the world on universal institutional daycare, which I am very uh, against. Um, I'm really more a supporter of providing families with choices uh, like they do in Finland, stipends so they can make the best choice for their family and have at least one primary attachment figure home, whether it's the mother or the father. Um, parent education is critical to preventing uh, mental health issues because we know that the foundation for mental health is in the first three years. And then we have another critical window in adolescence, which is nine to 25, much longer than we thought. Um, early childhood intervention programs, as Willem talked about, are really important for at-risk children and parents to offer a stable, emotionally supportive environment. Um, early treatment of mental illness is critical that we have uh, mental health services that are accessible and affordable. And we know that, that we do not have that right now. Um, and we, we know that there is an epidemic of, we talk about the pandemic of COVID, but we don't talk about the epidemic of mental illness, particularly in children and adolescents who will be adults. That was really um, happening well before COVID happened. And lastly, uh, workplaces that promote a psychological kind of health and safety uh, as a prevention for mental health issues. Very, very useful tips. Yeah. Yes, and I think the issue of youth mental health, again, we should come back to that because that is going to be, I saw it in my own family. I have teenagers and one of them did not do well being at home for 18 months. So despite all best efforts. So this is, and we're going to live with this whole generation that went through all of that. So thank you very much. Jean. Uh, yes, okay. So uh, promoting lifelong health, uh, like others says, it's um, cost effective. It's, a, it's an investment. And it's uh, it done from uh, early childhood would be uh, most uh, effective. So uh, paying attention to children's nutrition, exercise, uh, and nowadays limit time in digital devices use uh, is part of, uh, part of this healthy lifestyles. Uh, and uh, you know, research has shown that uh, uh, health is this cumulative process. 
and uh, if you invest early, then uh, in middle childhood and uh, old age, uh, all things would become better. Nowadays, people live longer, have longer life expectancy, but many live with a lot of disabilities. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so what you we would want to strive for is a healthy longevity, mm -hmm. uh, not just to live longer. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the important things to do is this preventive care from uh, early childhood, and that could accumulate through um, different life stages including at old age uh, then it won't you know people uh, the the health care cost won't be so high that's one in terms of uh, um, economic aspect but people's mental health uh, cognitive functioning uh, also will not be as bad and, and a lot of research have shown that so yes it's definitely important to promote to to, to promote lifelong health preventive care Thank you, Jean. I like the term healthy longevity and keeping the theme of family central. I was thinking about this. The minute someone, you can have a very well-functioning family system, and the minute someone becomes very ill, it can throw mm. everything into disarray. And so there's two goals here, keeping the individuals yeah. healthy and helping the family function and cope with whatever may happen. So, so thank you very much. Uh, Francesca. Thank you. Uh, I, I agree with what has been said. Basically, we have to see COVID as a watershed. There's a before COVID and an after COVID era, era in responding to this question. Yeah. Uh, COVID brought uh, clear uh, issues in terms of uh, physical uh, illness, potential disability, and mental illness, as it has been discussed very well. Uh, and so lots of threats for the long term, because we know also disability has an impact on family. COVID, the, the loss of our relative uh, is, has a big impact on the whole family, for instance, that there's important research on the multiplier effects of uh, losing someone uh, in an in a epidemic. Uh, I will just signal that a, a small opportunity of this situation, everyone became more alert to preventative, uh, uh, to, to prevention, preventive care, uh, kind of preventive behavior, masks or vaccines. And maybe this is the, only opportunity with respect of what is happening and what's been happening. Exploit the opportunity for the long run, because we know otherwise we'll pay the price of COVID. Thank you very much. And what you just said also, that really there's two phases and we've all experienced them, the before COVID and after COVID. So thank you. Yes. Uh, Livia, please. Yes, thank you. I would like to raise another issue because, uh, as it has been mentioned, our early childhood experiences has long-term consequences. And we know that one of the stressors that maybe many children go through these days is uh, the parents' separation because our family relationships are less and less stable. And uh, of course, it has uh, also uh, it, it separate causes, but um, how we can handle it, how we can deal with this situation for uh, ensure the well-being of children. And in the Families and Societies project, which was a large scale European collaborative project I uh, coordinated, and uh, we actually uh, significantly invested significant amount of time and research uh, amount in, in this focusing on this issue. And what we have found, for example, that the shared physical custody, uh, which is a relatively recent development, previously in case of divorce, uh, the child usually was assigned to the mother and it meant that uh, she or he lost uh, the father. And it had uh, very severe negative consequences, not only economically, but also in terms of self-esteem and uh, even mental health and other implications. So uh, in Sweden, it is now increasingly supported that uh, separated parents uh, will 
have shared physical custody because uh, and research has shown that it has positive implications for even children's health not only the economic of course that the, the uh, parents would um, share the economic burden but it means that there is an attachment uh, for from the child to both parents even continuously even after the the parental relationship would end but it doesn't mean that the child would lose any parent in case of a separation so it had uh, it has very Im important and positive consequences for the children in terms of health benefits it has been shown that uh, uh, in um, children in shared physical custody they feel uh, about uh, just as well as children in intact families whereas children in lone parent families they are they have very severe economic and also health consequences so it means that we should of course it it would require uh, from the parents that they can kind of collaborate uh, but uh, society can ensure mediating services if the parents cannot really collaborate because this is very important for the children that the child should not lose a parent in case of uh, a family breakup. Thank you very much, Livia, for raising again this issue. This is very, there are a lot of different dimensions to this whole topic. So thank you. And Ahmed, please. Yeah, I'm getting another dimension, um, and um, this is aligned with what uh, Erica uh, mentioned earlier, that it is it is better and more uh, cost effective that to prevent mental illness, you know, rather than treating the mental illness. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm underlining, you know, the issue of the unprofessional and non-licensed counselors or uh, what they label some, themselves sometimes as life coach or personal life coach or you know online counselor that they can you know be available online at any time or they can even sometimes be available for visits anywhere you need them this could be on voluntary based or this could be uh, paid with the compensation i think this is a real disaster because if 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 these people are you know unprofessional and and non licensed so it is, it, is, it is raising an issue of, you know, the level and the quality of the uh, service that they provide, especially they are not dealing with such, you know, any kind of issue. This is mental health that needs to be treated properly with professional people. Thank you very much. Yeah, another very important point. I was just thinking about this in a very different context that, you know, have all these people who claim expertise and give advice to large numbers of people without actually knowing anything about the area. So this is proliferating in general, big through our through the internet, so and social media. So thank you very much, uh, Francesco. Uh, I, I think I I already tried oh, oh, to okay. answer. Okay, sorry, sorry. One, but... sorry about that. Uh, I okay. can go on. No problem. We will move to question five, please. Is establishing universal social protection with adequate benefit benefits key to reducing poverty and inequality and promoting social resilience and inclusion? And I will start just by saying I'm in the United States. And as you all know, there's a lot of conflict around this topic. So this is not, uh, again, a very complex issue. So I'm not sure who would like to begin with this. I'm trying to make sure everybody gets to start. Um, Ahmed, why don't you start? Okay, the, the issue you mean of universal social protection, right? Yes, yeah. I, I think here, if we recall the, the concept of uh, social protection and social protection frameworks, if any entity, you know, propose a framework, this framework is being heavily criticized. When ILO proposed the SOGPRO, the social protection floor, it has been criticized by not including the informal sector, and it is exclusive for the formal labor sector. When, you know, UNICEF adopted this terminology of uh, child-friendly um, uh, social protection or child-responsive social protection, this also has been, you know, uh, uh, criticized by 
uh, not including the other members of the family. The same with the UN women and adopting the uh, gender sensitive social protection. I think uh, DEF with the uh, help of uh, UN ESQUA expertise, we also kind of uh, try to uh, enter into this uh, uh, policy debate and dilemma with the conceptualization of a new uh, framework of family uh, sensitive social protection and uh, you know this also could be criticized by leaving the non-family maybe members behind but in particularly if we are talking about adopting this terminology family sensitive social protection and this policy framework in our region i think it is very valid because you know the family is the fundamental unit in in in, in these societies in the middle east at large and the social protection systems in many countries in the GCC and in the MENA region have been also criticized by being many, uh, you know, the, the aspect of being breadwinner oriented, not family focused. So I think uh, getting the, the, the family unit as the foundation for the design of social protection is a critical uh, solution for a more inclusive uh, social protection in the region. Thank you very much. And thank you for bringing the cultural and regional piece into this. And that's where things get very, very complicated and messy. So, so we'll go to Sweden then from, from the MENA region. Livia, please. Yes, thank you. Well, of course, Sweden is the poster child of the universal social protection. And uh, we actually greatly enjoy the benefits of that. Uh, because um, it, it seems that uh, there is a, a rather high level of social inclusion uh, when we look at, for example, poverty rates for children, even of uh, lone parents, it's much lower than in other societies. Uh, so it is, it is uh, extremely important, as, as we see, uh, the universal um, uh, social protection. Of course, it is uh, tax-based uh, here in our societies in the Nordic countries. So it means that there is also a heavy emphasis that uh, each individuals on their own rights should be able to um, engage in the labor force because it will empower them uh, at the end, uh, for example, for retirement to have their own economic resources, which is important for the pension issue that we are going to discuss also. Uh, and of course, this also means that we have to uh, provide uh, uh, social services that would enable individuals irrespective of their family environment to be able also to engage in the in the labor force. I would like to also um, mention here the, the migrant issues that we, we also discussed because of course this is this is also very important. So if we have a universal social protection, it also means that migrants are included uh, because it's not uh, yeah there is no discrimination against them. So it it actually may uh, may have their uh, easier social integration also uh, in, in the society. So, so um, well, of course, living here in Sweden, I can only highly praise <laughs> this system because I think this is really most beneficial and most inclusive. The other thing that we need to keep in mind that uh, which is uh, good for uh, universal social protection, that there is no discrimination depending on what kind of family form or what kind of family arrangement one experiences. And this is crucial because we know, especially uh, since the second demographic transition started, so uh, from the basically the 1960s, that uh, marriage propensity is declining and uh, young people usually start their family life by entering non-marital cohabitation and even having children than in non-marital cohabitation. So this is really good that there is no uh, this distinction uh, in terms of social uh, protection or social coverage by what kind of family form individuals are living in. Thank you. Hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, just a comment, I do some work in Greece and the problem there with migrants is they come to Greece, they all want to go to Germany and the North European countries because of the social protection system and the educational system. This makes the topic of migration very complex in those contexts. What do you offer them when they all want to leave? But I'll leave it at that. Erika, please. Well, we know when people are impoverished and unsupported, they are more likely to experience mental health issues, stress, anxiety, depression. 
um, and they're more likely to leave their children um, at a much earlier age, as early as six weeks in America to go back to work full time. Often you have two parents working full time and children being put into daycare at six weeks. And, you know, so our issue in America is that we pay a lot of lip service to family being important. I'm in America too. Um, we pay a lot of lip service to family being important, but we won't pay for it because of this issue of personal freedom and personal responsibility, which is such a big thing here, and self-sufficiency. We know that if parents are not supported by the government with paid maternity leave and paternity leave, uh, they will have to go back to work. Many, many, many people will have to go back to work too early. Um, so, you know, it, it's a real problem. There is a, a problem on the other side, which is if we have too much uh, government interference, um, and, and again, I go back to the idea of Finland offering um, the idea of protection in the form of a payment to families where they can stay home with their children part time uh, or make the choice of having a grandmother care for their children. So if we have too much government interference, then we have the government telling us how to raise our children. So it's some balance between n n there needs to be a, 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 a security net for families so they can be with their children in those early years when children need attachment security uh, without necessarily imposing uh, their views that the government can do better. And we know in Romania that really didn't work. You know, the idea that the government can do better in raising your children. Um, you know, families need to have the, uh, the choice. And that's, I think that's really critical. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> yes to everything you just said, so being in America as well. Yeah. So. Uh, Francesco, please. Thank you. I sit in the middle between uh, Middle East, North Africa, and Sweden. So maybe I will take the <laughs> Italian perspective. Uh, first of all, uh, a little bit about the universal world and the experience of Italy. Uh, about three years ago, Italy put uh, down a basic income uh, for adults uh, policy. As with all universal social protection, there is a short term and a long term issue. In the short term, for sure, it reduces policy, well, poverty and inequality. What we have to make sure is that they don't become traps. So this is kind of on the adult perspective, and this is the, the tricky issue. Uh, but certainly some form of basic income is desirable uh, as long as it ensures social inclusion in the long run. What uh, the basic income policy in Italy missed were uh, children. For some reason, it seemed that uh, social protection was only for adults and children didn't need uh, social protection. So in a sense, we miss of the Swedish model, the universality that will include children. And one of the problems we have, and given this context, it's important that I said, is that the idea was that families should take care of children. So this is a big mistake. We have to have universal social protection, treating children in a, in a similar way. And we know also from one of the previous questions that investments in children pay in the long term. So luckily, the Italian government has recently put a general measure, which is far less generous than the basic income measure for all children, independently on parental status. But this is recent. It's last this month, 1st of January 22. So when we mean universal, we need to take into account that the weakest of all are the kids. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Yeah, very important point. And Jean, please. Uh, yes, I would say social protection uh, is definitely important uh, for lifting, reducing poverty and inequality. Um, but I think in, in uh, Singapore, uh, I would say that it's not necessarily universal policies, although uh, we can have different strategies for different segments of the population. Um, uh, important uh, segment of population like children that uh, many of us have mentioned. That's very important, of course, to ensure that children have um, 
early childhood protection, health care, food, housing, uh, education opportunity, that's all very important. Um, here in Singapore, government takes a very big role, has a very big role. And um, so these uh, opportunities are heavily subsidized. So parents don't have to pay a lot of um, money for them, but uh, there are different um, uh, kind of services uh, that suits parents' uh, different preferences for services or ability to choose services, I I'm afraid. Um, that uh, seem to also work quite well. So it's not just the government who's, um, uh, uh, you know, have the responsibility of uh, the social protection, but uh, the community, nonprofit organization and the market uh, work together to improve the quality of care um, a different kind of care for, for young children and for older adults these days that becomes uh, more and more important. So I think, uh, you know, I, I, my view is uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be universal, and, uh, but some cares are more critical um, uh, for, for children uh, in particular. And that uh, I, I agree that uh, public safety nets are very, very important, and the government should play a, a very big role in that. Thank you very much, Jean. Uh, I also, we, I'm hearing all the regional differences, and I'm also thinking about scale, because it's one thing to talk about a country that has 10, 15, 20 million people versus a country that has 330 million people or over a billion people. And so I just want us to remember that because it becomes very, very complicated when you start talking larger scale and highly heterogeneous with many different value systems and everything else. So just to sort of keep in the back of our minds. Okay, next question. Will eliminating age-related discrimination, including age barriers in employment, make an important contribution to reducing inequality, increasing productivity, and promoting economic growth? Another very complicated and big question. So why don't we start with why don't we start with Francesca this time? Thank you. This is a this is a difficult question. Uh, maybe I will qualify the answer. It is a yes, but important is important, not necessarily in a quantitative sense, but in kind of in an ethical sense. So it is an important contribution to kind of eliminate age-related discrimination uh, in the European Social Survey. We had the opportunity to field the. Uh, a module called uh, Timing of Life. The European Social Survey is fielded across many European countries. And we asked to Europeans, to the respondents, or the ESS asked to respondents, uh, at what stage do we become old? One kind of question, and, and uh, at what age, sorry. And, and the other question is, at what age are we too old to work part-time? And what is surprising is the enormous difference across countries that you find. So context here is important even within the European Union. In mm -hmm. particular, there is a sort of east-north gradient where Sweden is, of course, or Iceland is the bastion of becoming old later or, let's say, less age discrimination or age discrimination kicks in later, while... As you move east and south, basically, we tend to become old sooner. So in a sense, it is important to understand that this has both a cultural and sometimes also um, a physical health component. So if you are in a country where, for instance, life expectancy is low and a health situation is worse, it is not surprising that we find uh, more age discrimination. On the other hand, uh, it is uh, something that is rooted in our laws. The idea that age marks the start of uh, 
stages in life is so rooted in our thinking and it's also rooted in law that it's hard to eliminate on the other hand some people will want to for instance lower their commitment to work so the, the simple answer is yes but we have to take a lot into account cultural differences thank you very much a great way to stop this complicated discussion <laughs> ahmed please uh, eliminating age-related uh, discrimination is uh, essential, and I guess uh, this is not uh, particularly addressed to a specific age group. Um, my colleague just highlighted the issue of maybe discrimination against uh, aging or against elderly, but there is also discrimination against young people in the labor force structure. Mm -hmm. When I myself, you know, I, I went to Korea in 2009 and I studied my master's degree, I found, you know, a, a, a professor teaching us uh, statistical analysis using a system, not SPSS, not a stata, but a system he developed. He's very in intelligent to, to the extent that he developed the software. He's, he's in a position of, you know, professorship and he's 35 years old with, you know, two assistant professors with like 50 plus years old. So this this is hard. You find this, you know, uh, uh, you know this uh, combination, and in, in, for instance, in Arab countries. Uh, so I think uh, uh, removing this uh, barriers of age-related discrimination is applicable and is applicable for all age groups. Mm -hmm. And I think this discussion is very important to remove all kind of layers of discrimination, not only the age-related discrimination. There is an important research that just you know, uh, published, I think, in 2019, uh, related to discrimination in hiring based on potential and realized fertility. And this is evidence from a large scale uh, field experiment in Switzerland, Germany, and Australia, where, you know, they mapped 9,000 job applicants, and they found out that employers tend to exclude women in fertility age because they know that they will be entitled to maternity protection, leave policies, flexible working arrangements. So they avoid hiring uh, uh, females in fertility age. They may hire female, you know, in, in, in a little bit uh, uh, elderly kind of uh, age, or they avoid hiring females at all in fertility age and, and replacing this by males. So this is, you know, contributing to, and this is the, the, the concept of unintended consequences of, of policy, because, Maybe the country provide kind of you know generous uh, work family balance policies, but also there should be some uh, you know uh, uh, measures to uh, not to have the practice deviation from uh, several uh, beneficiaries and stakeholders. Thank you for raising this. We when we read age related discrimination, we tend to think about the the older part of the life course. And for raising the issue of youth, I was also reading like during the pandemic, they were the first ones to lose their jobs. You know, when you look at it from a global perspective and then the <laughs> issue of women in, in, in I've, I've actually been in discussions where I have heard people say exactly what you just said. We're not going to hire this woman because what if she has a baby in the next two or three years? So I've, People are open about it a lot of times. So and this is in America yeah. where people sue for <laughs> these kinds of discussions. So thank you. Yeah. Jean, please. Uh, yes, I, I also appreciate raising that issue. Uh, but let me also talk about the older age groups and the ageism um, that involves, you know, older adults having more trouble uh, finding a job if they lose a job and you know, age 50 and above having trouble finding a job, but also the issue of forced retirement. Um, some countries have this and some countries don't. Uh, I think uh, the study shows that uh, as people now live longer and healthier and with a lot of uh, human capital uh, accumulated over time, you know, uh, retirement, forced retirement at age 60 doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Even at 65 or a certain arbitrary cutoff point does not uh, make a lot of sense. 
um, it, it, the research has shown there's this kind of uh, forced retirement or even hinting that uh, or uh, informally uh, telling people that the, it's about time that they, they retire reduces people's motivation and aspiration for work um, and uh, make them feel uh, start to feel depressed and not wanting to uh, work so hard. So in a way, it's uh, demoralizing. Uh, it's demoralizing and it's counterproductive. Um, as all countries are getting older, older adults are the most valuable assets on uh, these aging societies as um, you know, working age population shrinks. So we don't want to lose or waste these um, valuable human resources that are accumulated. Um, in many of the older adults. I think we want to focus on these um, productive aging um, and healthy aging again, allowing people to have more choices and flexibilities in choosing uh, what kind of work arrangement and uh, they would like. Uh, th this kind of uh, productive aging and um, uh, healthy aging attitude and approach, yeah, these all would uh, benefit the workforce, and uh, it could promote both economic vitality and keep people healthy. Um, work, as uh, many studies have shown, actually keep people healthy. It's the best medicine for keeping people healthy. So uh, that's something uh, it, it's worth considering. Thank you very much. Yes, I'm hearing the theme, give the individual the choice and not have barriers in place. So thank you. Erica, please. Um, the answer is yes, we should get rid of the age-related discrimination. Age is um, uh, when we feel we're no longer needed. According to Freud, we need love and work for our humanness. And so um, when we don't feel we are needed or we have meaningful work, uh, we age more quickly and we, we become ill. We often become mentally ill. Uh, work is protective against depression, particularly in men. There are many studies that show that, um, you know, retirement has long been studied as a source of mental health decline. Um, it's something you said to hear earlier, um, that there's a strong correlation between men's feelings of self-worth through employment and depression when the, the employment ends. Um, thirdly, um, work working longer gives, in America, there are some bills now on the table that have been on the table for a while. Um, uh, you know, the idea that work gives us the option, if we work longer, gives us caregiving windows when we're younger. So meaning if we can work longer and contribute to the social security system. For a longer period of time, we can take breaks when our children are zero to three. Uh, there was a bill that said that, you know, women who are caregiving should be supported with social security during these years. But the idea is that um, we, we can take breaks of caregiving when we have young children, when we have an elderly parent. And if we work longer, we can still uh, invest in that social security system and and not be impoverished in the outcome. Uh, and lastly, the wisdom and experience of the elderly is lost when they retire early. Uh, we forget how much wisdom and experience they have. Um, well, I'm 57, we have. Uh, as you get older, you, you get better. And the idea that um, we sort of discard our elderly uh, rather than um, you know, really take advantage of the wisdom. Thank you very much. And uh, I want us again to be very practical and be thinking about recommendations about what to do, because I'm seeing even, for example, at my university, there's a push to get all the older people out and replace them with as young people as possible, because it is so much cheaper. So it is, you know, everything always comes down to economics and we forget the experience and wisdom that people bring to the table. But how, how do we you know, again, how do we change that, 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 that dial a little bit? So, uh, Livia, please. Yes, thank you. It, uh, it has been said how important it is to take away the age barriers. And actually in Sweden, it's a good example also on that, for example, education. 
Uh, there used to be uh, age limits for uh, educational enrollment for, for universities, and Sweden take this away. So now you can be a 70 year old. If you fit for PhD studies, you are free to do that in Sweden. So it's not the economic um, considerations which would uh, uh, limit your ambitions. It's, it's really, it's a very important uh, step in the right direction uh, against ageism, I, I believe. On the other hand, I think we should also think about the, the uh, well, nearly gl global response on COVID, because uh, the aged as such group has been kind of singled out. Of course, they were the one most affected, given that they uh, have more health challenges. But nevertheless, uh, it was rather simplistic to say that if you are over age 65 or so, then, then your uh, freedom to move in the society should be limited. So you will be more restricted compared to younger people. In Sweden, actually, we had uh, it was not that many restrictions. I know in many other countries there was complete lockdown, but not in Sweden. It's only the elderly who were, uh, well, those of age 70 plus. They were really restricted in uh, socializing and others, but not the younger people. So there, it's it's actually a contradiction that you can go to the university. There is no age limit there, but when it comes to the response to COVID, then there was suddenly this strong ageism, and it means that there is still we really have to think more about uh, our uh, perceptions of of age and um, old age people. That what does it mean? And of course, there is a strong not only individual but even social economic or socioeconomic. And gradient here because uh, usually the uh, people in um, um, well, uh, more physical um, occupations then their health is deteriorating more rapidly maybe don't, they don't want to stay on in the labor market for very long they, they they want to really retire whereas university professors they are happy to work in their age 80 mm -hmm. and still can be productive so there should be a certain kind of flexibility to make it possible that we are not forcing people to stay on who, who are actually not able, like the, the, those in manufacturing industries and others who, who are still able to produce, they can stay on and produce. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, no, that, that's a really interesting point that even in a society like Sweden, that is as egalitarian as it is, that still there was this hidden ageism that came out under those circumstances. And yeah, I did not realize that. It's very interesting. Thank you. I think everyone's answered these questions, correct? So we're going to move on to question seven. Would recommending retirement savings be the right way to improve the financial independence of individuals and support aggregate capital accumulation? So I'm assuming this means individual retirement savings. Yes. Who would who would like to start? Um, Jean, maybe? Um, uh, sure. <laughs> Again, uh, I think we have already seen this uh, regional differences in terms of different kind of policies that we've been talking about. Um, but I've always uh, uh, I've lived in United States and Canada before too. Um, so, but um, I've, I've always thought that it was a great practice to um, start saving um, as you go uh, when you are young and uh, save part of your uh, salaries, working uh, wages um, as your retirement saving. And, but, that system has, um, you know, maybe just the, the jobs that I have. Usually I also benefit from, from the employee, uh, employer too. They, they either have matched um, savings or, um, you know, better different packages than uh, for, for the employers. And I think that's a very good uh, way to, um, to start saving from a young age. And so that, um, again, in Singapore, uh, the system is th uh, these, um, um, you know, saving as you go. Uh, and then by the time you are old, you have uh, 
enough to support yourself uh, or, or at least um, uh, some to support yourself that's so you don't burden um, or other family members or um, other uh, the, the society at large. So I, I think that's a, a good way to go. Uh, it can be uh, self-saving plus some kind of government uh, uh, subsidized uh, pension system that uh, in combination that helps um, people as they uh, get older. So it, it definitely will improve the financial independence for individuals but the problem uh one of the problem is of course for women um you know many of them uh, would work uh, would be housewife home homemakers or work half time and so their savings are going to be uh limited or compared to those who have worked full time and for men in particular so older women it, it always ends up that um at all age, they don't have very much to draw from, uh, especially if they're um, divorced um, at later age uh, and have low education and do not work very much. So yeah, it's it's a good system, but uh, you know, it, 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 the different segment of the population uh, will have different kind of problems, especially Thank older women. Yes, thank you very much. And thank you for raising the gender differential, which is an enormous problem with this specific issue. So Erica, please. You know, um, there is, as I said earlier, there's something in, in America, a bill about providing social security payments for caregivers while they're not working outside the home, but they're working inside the home, whether it's caring for children or caring for the elderly. I think that's a very good practical plan, which is that it, it then treats um, caregiving as valuable work. Um, we know that adults who are more financially comfortable have better physical and mental health. So that's a, that's a given. Um, a couple of practical things I'm thinking of, um, we don't really incentivize people to save. Uh, if you, in America, we have commercials on television ads for really wealthy people who go to Charles Schwab and these fancy, you know, agencies or whatever, stockbrokers. We really don't incentivize people who are uh, working in um, lower socioeconomic jobs to put away five dollars a week. There are no ad campaigns. There's no government incentive. There's no, there's no real incentive. Uh, to do it. So that would be one practical thing. Um, and then the intergenerational piece. So uh, we talked in the last question about, um, you know, the idea of work and how important it is for the elderly. And I'm thinking of Livia, her answer, and that some people might not want to continue to work in their factory job, and that is totally understandable. But we don't really give the elderly, so there's different kinds of work, and there's caring work, caregiving work, which still is meaningful, I would say even more meaningful work, uh, relational work, and we don't pay that work. So the idea that we would give families the stipends, again, I hate to drill this in, but so elderly people in the family could care for the younger people, their grandchildren, they can care for their grandchildren instead of institutional daycare, you know, so we are paying our elderly to do what they always did traditionally when everybody lived in one house, right, which is they're caring for their grandchildren. That is such a critical thing that is missing today is intergenerational caregiving and grandparents can't afford to do it. So if we can give them the resources in a very practical way, now we've covered two birds with one stone. We've given elderly people meaningful work that is paid labor, and we've addressed the caregiving issue for, for women and men who have to go out to work and have young children. Thank you very much. And it creates stronger family relationships. Yes, it does. Yeah. Livia, please. Yes, thank you. Well, I, I was thinking of this, uh, the private savings that uh, we have to, we already discussed the situation of, for example, alone parents. They might don't have the possibility to have any, put down any savings, and it might uh, be a significant part of their life. 
they might stuck on the low paid jobs. So um, requiring or making this a crucial part of the pension system, uh, this uh, may increase inequalities, social inequalities, and really hit those who we want to protect, I think. So this here, uh, I understand that it is, of course, a very important thing. And here in Sweden, in the pension system is actually, um, uh, re, uh, it was reformed. And there are important information campaigns, how important it is that, that we actually make also our own savings. And, and it is important. But we also have to now think of the, the young people and uh, given the covid we have discussed that labor market has changed there are uh, many uh, like these non-traditional jobs the gig sector which doesn't really provide the same good conditions than the traditional uh, work provided so how how can we make sure that uh, even people working in in these uh, non-traditional non-standard employments uh, they they can uh, provide enough for themselves for the, or make the savings for elderly days. So I think we really have to uh, be very careful about how we design uh, future pension systems to uh, not uh, be unfair for uh, others who, uh, well, it's, it's beyond uh, their call. Uh, for example, if they, they can't find young people, many young people don't find jobs these days. So it's not their fault, but then if we force them to save, then it might jeopardize other uh, life decisions. Mm -hmm. So this is this is a very delicate issue. Thank you, thank you for bringing the the spectrum, economic spectrum discussion into this and informal jobs. And this is very complicated topic again. So thank you, Ahmed. Please. Uh, I think this topic is really uh, important, and in the region there is kind of uh, clear lack of social justice in terms of the whole retirement uh, the uh, ambition system because it it doesn't only exclude the uh, informal sector but you know um, the 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 issue erica highlighted of intergenerational caregiving is very clear in the region but the, the it does not you know have this kind of formal support of the uh, and the recognition of of unpaid uh, care, uh, so this is an issue. And I was, you know, talking to one of my colleagues. She, she's a, a former minister of uh, social development in Jordan. I'll, I'll give just a clear example of how countries they really, you know, try to institutionalize the informal sector and try to have the the national funds, you know, to reach out to the informal sector. But they were, when, when they try to, you know, uh, register the people in the informal sector, they go to the NGOs, they go to the shops to, to register the names. Here, there's an, another issue which is related to the lack of trust. So the employers, instead of giving names, they are afraid of giving names to the, uh, you know, the, the national security kind of entity because th this is part of the governmental body. So they understand that by giving the names of the people that are working with us in the informal sector, th there is another entity will come tomorrow from this governmental body will ask me for more taxes. So there is the, the issue is really complex and, and it is from, from country to another, you will find a lot of uh, issues, but at the end, uh, the, this causes a lot of uh, inequality in the uh, system at large. Mm -hmm. Thank you. The question is what to do. So, Francesca. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I agree with all colleagues. Basically, inequality is the more is the biggest obstacle uh, in, uh, to answer this question. But assume uh, we are talking about someone who could possibly save. So, first, solving inequality is essential. Um, so, with, with colleagues uh, from the Department of Finance at Bocconi, we did some work on uh, financial literacy. And this is linking up with what we discussed before uh, about uh, lifelong learning. So, here there is something we can do because there are inequalities not only in the economic sense that we already discussed, but also in the knowledge that is available to plan for the future in basic financial knowledge, in knowledge about how long our life could be, in knowledge about the risk of becoming long-term sick and having the need to 
to kind of pay for long-term care. And here there is a, a standard gradient on education, but there is also a gender gradient where women are uh, weaker in financial literacy. So here is something where we could do some we, we could do a, a policy intervention, and the policy intervention is make sure that everyone knows about the basics of uh, financial planning, the basic of pension retirement planning, and this is not only for uh, children and doing it at school, but also for uh, adult workers and non-workers. Mm -hmm. And, and it, it is possible to do so. We did an experiment with factory workers in Italy, and indeed uh, those who could save, uh, they saved a bit more and they used more the, the, the retirement uh, planning schemes before, uh, after the, the intervention. So it is kind of not only recommending, but providing the sort of lifelong learning that is crucial, on top of, of course, of addressing the basic economic inequality. Francesco, that is a wonderful answer, just wonderful. And I rarely hear, at least here, hear this discussion, because a lot of people do not understand even the basics, how long they're going to live and what they will need when they are older. And I have colleagues who they don't they don't understand their own retirement accounts. And you are right about the gender piece. I did a study several years ago where I interviewed couples separately and together about work life issues. And I couldn't believe how many women they were working. Both were working, etc. Et the women did not know the financial status of their family. They said, oh, my husband, he takes care of all of that. I just put the money, I have the money put into our account and he invests it and he's dealing with our future retirement. I was really stunned by the answers. So thank you very much. So that leads us to our last question, which is how will adopting social security reforms to account for the widening gap in longevity by socioeconomic status contribute to reducing inequality? Would it also reduce uncertainty about future benefits and allow individuals to better plan for their retirement? Well, we're already in this discussion on exactly this topic. So, um, Francesco, since you were so in it, why don't we start with you? <laughs> Oh, thank you. So Italy had a number of social security reforms starting in the 90s, and it was triggered by demographic uh, projections and projections on the expenditures uh, forecasts uh, for the social security, which was, uh, it still is a pay as you go system. And there was a social security reform in which the basic pension formula now has a uh, life expectancy at retirement at the denominator. Um, okay, first of all, let me touch upon one of the untold stories. Of course, there are some gender inequalities in longevity. So what the Italian reform did was to take the average life expectancy. Uh, so one of the consequences is exactly what's in the question, is that if you use average life expectancy, you introduce potential inequality because average life expectancy, even if it were a prospective measure, is the average. And then there are important differences by uh, usually by job, uh, by socioeconomic status there. Um, and this is something that has not been easily addressed. What uh, the Italian reform subsequently did in a very painful way, was using uh, mortality data to understand what are the kind of uh, hard work or uh, kind of uh, hard jobs that are, have consequences on the length of life. Uh, it, is, it is difficult because you have to do it continuously. New jobs are, are coming into play and there are huge uh, a huge number of small professions that are very dangerous. So the bottom line is, yes, some corrections can be made on inequality, but the, the basic idea is that you have to reduce inequality in the length of life. And so that's kind of, that should be the policy goal rather than use 
pension reforms to correct for differential length of life. Uh, and whether reforms will reduce uncertainty about future benefits and uh, allow individuals to better plan for their retirement. I'm afraid I'm a bit skeptical because, again, start from a country that uh, had uh, waves of reform from the 90s and the last reform is now. So there is a continuous reform. Once you kickstart social security reform, you introduce uncertainty about future benefits because the concept of reform is maybe there will be another reform again. So I'm a bit afraid that uh, there will be uncertainty about the future benefits. And the key is, of course, complementing public policy with uh, individual retirement savings. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for re raising the issue of prevention to begin with. So we're back to where we started with that. Thank you. Jean, please. Uh, yeah, I agree with what Francisco says. I, I just want to mention the, uh, bring up the example of um, China to, uh, to uh, illustrate how difficult these kind of things might be. Um, China, as uh, you may know, that have different retirement age for men and women. And the retirement age for women has not been mm -hmm. changed since 1950s. Um, you know, for professional women, they could retire and it's, it's a mandatory retirement at age 55. And, uh, you know, lower skilled women, uh, their retirement age is 50. So we, we were just talking about how women would accumulate less assets and savings um, throughout their lives uh, because of their lower wages and uh, fewer work hours, um, mostly because of the caregiving responsibility in their lives and so on. Um, so they retire a lot earlier, um, but women save less, but they also live much longer than well, they live longer than men. And so uh, the, the country has been talking about uh, reforming these um, retirement and, and the pension system. Um, and uh, it's taking a long time and didn't, I don't think they figure out how to do this yet. Um, so definitely, you know, high SES and low SES, high SES people live longer then they save um, more uh, along uh, the way. So how do we um, reform and adopt this uh, pension system and uh, social security system? Is I think it's important some kind of adjustment uh, can be made, but ex how to implement it becomes uh, very complicated and uh, difficult. Thank you. And thank you for raising the age barrier issue. This is true in many places. I was just talking to someone in England who's a professor, and she was telling me there's a mandatory retirement at 67. And she and her colleagues who are at that age, they don't want to retire. So it raises the issue of productivity and everything else. So thank you. Um, yeah. Livia, next, please. Yes, thank you. It is, uh, I agree, it's a very difficult issue and it uh, raises uh, many important aspects. Uh, for example, the, the, uh, the practice when to retire, we have seen that among couples uh, and the men are usually, um, they are older than the women, but they want, want to retire at the same time. So this would even add to what Jean just mentioned, that uh, it means that the woman would, uh, if she is younger and she already has a shorter working life and she will retire earlier, so having shorter working experience, and it means it, uh, she will have lower pension. So now uh, there is another issue that whether we, um, uh, we provide widow's pension or widower pension or not, because uh, that, that, uh, that might be another social equalizer or inequalizer. <laughs> Uh, that uh, may reduce the gender divide or not in, in uh, pension or living standards for pensioners. So there are some very, very important uh, issues here that uh, need, need to be addressed. But it's, it's not only, uh, maybe it's not only about 
pensions that we have to think of, but there are more important um, social aspects of aging. And here I would like to actually refer to the, the research network on aging society, because I think that they have some very important uh, message to us that how we can make aging more inclusive and more, more societal, more, uh, more easy for everyone and to make the society work, even if we having a more aging society. So they, uh, they actually uh, say that we have to assess the status of older uh, populations on five domains, the productivity and the engagement, so that it means that we allow older people to uh, remain productive and engaged uh, members of the society, either through paid work or maybe volunteering. The well-being issue, of course, is extremely important. And here we can think of the health care that we really guarantee for everyone. And uh, uh, we did not discuss it, uh, this issue around the ageism, but there are studies showing that um, but older people do not receive the same amount of treatments uh, and medical care than younger people who are of working ages do. So there are uh, studies on that, uh, and it was a meta uh, analysis so that it's uh, across societies. Then we have to think of the equity dimension, of course, and that, uh, that we have to reduce um, the inequalities between those who have and the have nots. The cohesion is, of, of course, also very important. Solidarity, we already discussed the intergenerational issues as well. And the security, that we have uh, both economic and physical security for older persons. So successful aging is something that we, we need to discuss more. Mm -hmm. And uh, here, even though we, we discussed um, uh, much of the economic implications of aging societies, but we haven't mentioned so much about the, the, um, the aspects of uh, having another person to talk to. And loneliness mm -hmm. is one of the crucial issues uh, for uh, a decent living, for, for, especially for elderly, because many of them uh, having a single uh, person household and they have very little social contact. So loneliness is something that needs to be increasingly uh, addressed for proper societal aging. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for raising all these different dimensions. So this is again, big complicated topic. Erica, please. Well, what we haven't discussed is that the birth rates are falling. Um, and as the, so the social security net is dependent upon the younger generation and enough of the younger generation working to support the older generation. The problem is that the birth rates are falling across the world and a uh, combination of factors as I see it, women having children later, the cost of raising children, lack of that security net for uh, caregiving, um, disinterest is, is the thing I'm seeing mostly in my clinical practice, disinterest in having children and making the sacrifices as a result of this kind of increasingly individualistic world, which doesn't have communal values. So, you know, the big questions, as you say, Bahira, you know, may not be as practical, but are really preventative and important, is addressing this issue of, you know, why aren't people interested in having children? What's happened to our interest? And I think a lot of that goes back to what I've said, which is culturally, we've moved towards work outside the home being emphasized as being more valuable mm -hmm. and caregiving work not being remunerated and not being seen as valuable and therefore people are saying you know i want to be out of the home i don't want to have children if i have children i'm going to have one child um so these are really big issues but they're also practical issues because if we don't address them the birth rate is going to continue to fall and the social security net will fall apart mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Again, this, I'm happy you raised the issue of fertility, but fertility is also directly connected to family friendly policies that yeah. allow people to balance both because there are yeah. European countries, I'm most familiar with Germany, where they have put in measures to help people negotiate those aspects of their life. And it has helped with the fertility rate. So people have children if they know they can, one, afford to have children, 
And two, if they know they're going to work for whatever reason, financial or for fulfillment, also personal fulfillment, as long as they know that they can do it. So when when it becomes too calm, I mean, I was just telling my class the other day when I was growing up, people had four, five, six children. Nobody I know has four, five or six children anymore. So it's just not financially viable. It's not doable anymore. So. Thank you. And last but not least, Ahmed, this is our last question. So, so I will comment on the fertility aspect, but uh, before that, I also have the uh, insight on the modalities for social security reform. There are many modalities, but the, the main aspect of reform is maybe to reduce inequality or developing the targeting uh, system and expanding the coverage. You need as a state more resources and ensure the sustainability of, of these resources. And resources is, is usually, you know, the, the key barrier for any uh, social security reform. So I think because if we are talking about solutions, I think one of the major solutions is the innovative approach for community based and the charity kind of inclusion in the formal system of the social security the uh, public-private uh, uh, partnership, this kind of, of, of initiatives, I think, uh, will help boosting the social uh, security reforms. And I, I totally agree with uh, Erika related to the disinterest of having children as, as a major, you know, um, cause of, of the lack of fertility rates and declining fertility rates. We have in, in Qatar a research on social aspects of fertility uh, led by Doha International Family Institute. And we investigated the causes for, you know, for people's perceptions on why the, the, they decide, why uh, the couples decide to have limited number of children. There are many aspects related to, you know, the need for better work family balance policies or, you know, financial support or uh, the care for quality parenting. However, the majority of the answers is, is about this kind of uh, individualistic perspective and is about this, the, the, the lifestyle and the uh, care maybe of, of uh, uh, some personal interests that are prioritized over the uh, family and over the number of children. So this is a clear, I think, uh, uh, issue. And if we are, you know, to conclude with some recommendations, I think investment in fertility uh, kind of evidence and research is really important and at the state and, and macro level, not only for uh, academia. Thank you very much for uh, a very practical perspective on this. Livia has raised her hand and wants to comment. So, Yes, thank you. Well, this, this issue about people not wanting to have children, uh, but this, this is not exactly the case, because when we look at uh, people's wishes, the desired and ideal family size, that uh, at least in European countries, uh, the majority wants to have at least two or more children, so it would be actually enough for the simple replacement of the population. So the, the problem is not the individualism, because people still, still want to have children, but it's rather why they don't have the desired number of children. So more the, the uh, structural barriers uh, or maybe other kind of barriers that what we need to and uh, the society, society and policymakers need to address that why these desired uh, children are not realized. So it's, uh, I don't see that even though childlessness is increasing that uh, studies have shown, but we actually even uh, discuss a so-called fertility gap and uh, this which is growing uh, this uh, between the desired number and the realized number of children. And I'm uh, sure uh, Francesco can add even more because uh, this is something which is a very important debate among demographers. Thank you. Thank you, Francesco. Thank you. First of all, I agree, of course, with Livia. Uh, I have to declare uh, uh, a sort of conflict of interest. And uh, we have five kids, so someone has uh, five children also in this world. But it, but, but it's tough, uh, and it's uh, it's it's rare. Um, but then uh, I would like to to put a skeptical view, even as a fertility expert. Fertility policies should not be seen as policies 
to uh, cover social security, especially in the next 10 to 20 years. They should not be policies to cover labor market mean, needs. They should not be policies for the country uh, to, to make sure there are enough nationals. Fertility or family-friendly policies are well-being policies, are policies for individuals to protect families and children. Uh, when we speak about social security, to be frank, we need to get back what is my mantra. It's the slow and fast nature of demography. So if we have to address social security need in the next 10 to 20 years, fertility is not going to help us at all by kind of very simple calculations. The only thing we can do is understand to bring in migrants who pay social security contributions. That's the only opportunities. Or to make sure that those who are not working, for instance, work women, enter the labor market and therefore also contribute to social security. It's not necessary. By definition, fertility is not going to solve any social security or labor market problem for decades. Well, it doesn't mean that we don't have to address fertility gaps. But they are for the, we have to address that for different reasons. I think your point is so important: short versus the short term versus the long term. Yes, and we will see. Germany is a wonderful example with the migration, so we will see what happens. I have to put a comment in here about the individualism piece. I really think individualism it's a piece of the puzzle. It's not the whole puzzle. It comes out as individualism, but it has to do with structural inequalities in the system that people then interpret as an individualistic choice. So they say, well, I don't want to have all these children because I want to pursue my job, education, hobbies, whatever. But it has to fundamentally to do with they don't know how they could balance all of this. Because there are many examples when, when people are given the opportunity to balance these things, they do end up having more children. And there's other pieces in this also. Women's fertility is highest when they are very young, when they are between 18 and 25. And this is now the time when they are in school studying. And so it pushes when women are having children to when they are older. I mean, there's a lot, this is a very complicated issue that is not easily solved because there's also the economic issue in there. So, so I just want to, I'm just always very careful about simplistic one element explanations to very large social phenomena. So I just want to caution us. Yes, Erica, please. I, you know, I hate to interrupt because it, it interrupts the, the forum that we have here, but um, what we didn't talk about is the, um, is the idea that at least in America, we don't really want to care for our elderly. And mm -hmm. it is a phenomenon that's, kind of around the globe now, didn't used to be, but you, we used to be sort of alone in our individualism. So I'm going to disagree with you a little bit here and saying that we really do have a problem in America with individualism. We want to send our elderly away. I mean, our elderly did it to themselves with this idea of retirement and moving away from your family. But you know, the concept that we don't feel responsible for our parents. Um, we, we feel that someone else should be. We put them in homes. I mean, the idea that people go into nursing homes and assisted living rather than live with extended family. I mean, if we're going to talk about depression and mental health, it's far better for, for, for elderly people to live in ex, in ex, with extended family than to, than to be separated in this way. So that is another example of this individualism, which is not only expressed on the front end, which is birth, but is also expressed on the back end, which is we don't really feel responsible to care for our elderly any longer. Yeah, it has a little bit to do, I think, thank you for raising that. I think that's a very good point with a fragmentation of social relationships in general, I would yeah. argue. So, you know, and this issue of duty and obligation <laughs> versus what I do for myself. And that's culturally determined, that's generationally determined. There's a lot, again, this is a complex 
issue. So to keep us on track, because I know Ignacio also wants to say a couple of words at the end and to be faithful to our focus group and my directions, the last question is, are there other issues you would like to raise? And Erica, thank you very much for raising the issue of elderly caregiving, which is uh, an issue that is a global issue and it's going to grow in our lifetime, is what should happen in that general sphere. But maybe others, you can comment on this, obviously, or other other topics that you think are very important in terms of these demographic shifts that we are in the middle of. And remember, the purpose is really to help set the agenda for the UN uh, you know, celebration of families plus 30 issues that need to be raised. And I think one of those is that. But the issue I also want to raise is, again, keeping things family focused, because this is my field. And I am more and more honestly saddened because I feel like there's not a lot of, yes, there's among us, this little groups that come together that discuss these issues. We all really care. But in the more general global sense, there's a movement away from discussing family issues, trying to support, at least from my perspective, trying to support families. I even see it in the academic study of families. It has gone very much in an individualistic direction instead of understanding the group. And the minute you say family, people launch into definitions and then they become political. You know, it's it, it, the discussion very quickly dissolves into a very, from my perspective, not a very useful place. So I just would like our sort of concluding thoughts to be around that. I don't know if anybody else sees it this way, but. I, I mean, I, I, I've i struggled with voicing very truisms in my writing. Um, uh, and being at risk because the things I say are politically incorrect. Mm -hmm. um, and all I write about is family and mm -hmm. children and parents. Mm -hmm. and, um, and it seems to me that the preoccupation today is with political correctness and mm -hmm. not with truths. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's what I'll say. Yeah. And yeah. that's sad. And that's sad for me. Yeah. Very sad. Yeah. yeah. And, and the minute you use the word, at least, I mean, I'm in America too, you use the word family, people directly think you are like this ultra conservative person, blah, blah, blah. So it's a big problem. So, yeah. Yes, uh, Ahmed. Yeah, I think uh, if we are also talking about uh, demography and in preparation for the international year of the family, the institution of marriage is, is missing, I think, in our uh, discussion the barriers that face uh, used to enter into this institution of marriage, not only the structural barriers in terms of socioeconomic kind of factors, but also the uh, perceptions and the, you know, relational well-being and also the fear from, from marriage in, in terms of, you know, the increased uh, um, divorce rates so that, you know, maybe this is one of the factors that, you know, that make the, the, the youth to decide to go back and not to step into this, uh, you know, uh, marriage institution. So I guess like uh, having this as a sub theme or investing some, you know, uh, research and in, in, in particular element of the institution of marriage is, is really important. And and if you, we, we have we have this, uh, you know, the the our latest conference is about the institution of marriage. And we are now conducting a research, and I think this is good to be shared in another uh, platform about assessing the marital relationship in the first five years of marriage, because the majority of divorce cases are in the early marriage. So there is kind of a, a concern here, and we are, you know, investing and examining the relationship in the Arab countries at least to see what are the, uh, you know, the the causes of the early. Um, fragmentation of the institution of marriage. Thank you, wonderful point. Livia, please. Yes, thank you. I actually just would like to uh, mention if we are talking about marriage and divorce, that there is an increasing segment of the elderly population who are divorcing. This is a new phenomenon, which is called the gray divorce. 
And that's even more uh, challenging for the society in terms of maybe not necessarily the economic support point of view, but the social support. And uh, I already mentioned loneliness, how important is that? And uh, as here we have an important gender dimension actually, but because usually the children still keep in touch with their mother. Uh, and even if, I mean, we are talking about elderly, but maybe the father will remain alone if the family is split up. So, so the, the loneliness of elderly men, uh, or many of them actually maybe don't have children, so then, then it's uh, uh, speaking about our childlessness issue, growing childlessness. This is a huge um, and uh, a, a huge issue and a huge issue for, for well-being that we need to discuss. The other thing about the family, I just would like to mention the, the fam increasing family complexity, which is not necessarily a bad thing, uh, it just we have to learn how to how to uh, handle this because I don't think that it would be a good solution to to force certain institutions on people like that. Uh, well, even marriage, uh, it might be that some people are not. Um, they they have some other interpretation of marriage that they they uh, they oppose. So then, why don't we allow them to have another stable um, and uh, rewarding relationship? And we, now we even increasingly have the living apart together relationships, uh, which means at least that people have a, a stable partner, but they don't even move in together. So there are this incredible um, diversity of partnerships and social relationships, which is not necessarily a bad thing. We just have to learn to work with it. Mm -hmm. And uh, one issue that we haven't mentioned is actually large families, because they are still around, even though uh, I know you, you have mentioned, Bahira, that there, you don't know personally uh, people with, with many children, but there are, in, in, we have the large families associations, so, so that it's still an existing family form, and of course Francesco mentioned his personal <laughs> example, so, so they are still around, so we have to uh, also make sure to accommodate them to make uh, provide equal opportunities for their children because many of, of uh, uh, the large families might be at risk of economic vulnerability given that only one parent uh, would work in many cases, it depending of course the social context. So I think that the family complexity and that we, we, we see that there is diversity and we just have to make this work for the benefit of everyone, that's the major challenge. And it's not impossible at all. It just, we have to have more, uh, well, um, maybe more accepting of, of people's choices and helping them to, uh, to make society to thrive. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for raising the issue of elderly men alone. I know that in the United States, this is a growing, huge, complicated, problem that most people are not aware of that has not been part of the whole divorce and children discussion. So what happens at that end of the spectrum? Thank you all. This has been a wonderful discussion and really interesting. And many have been trying to take some notes about practical recommendations. And I know Ignacio really wanted to say something. So thank you very much, Bahir. I just want to thank all of you for being here today. And as it has been said, we are really fully involved in these preparations of the 30th anniversary of the International Year of the Family, which will still go on for some years until 2024. We're doing this together with other international and national organizations. And we, want, we, we really want to turn this anniversary into a substantial and enriching discussion to bring the role of the family unit and policies towards social development into reality, especially in those four mega trends that, as you know, have been established. And one of them is precisely demographic shifts. I can also tell you that this focus group has been watched by around 40, 50 people who are really interested in it. Some of them professors from other universities, the focal point of the family at the UN, heads of civil society organizations. And so I do hope that the, the outcomes will be useful. We will produce a publication and you will be updated about 
the whole process. But I think, yeah, I think it, it, it will be very interesting, as Bahira and some of you were mentioning, to, to really give uh, information, documentation, ideas, recommendations to, to not only to the UN, but to all governments who seem to be a bit doubtful about what to do in this field for the future. And I think there has been many, many good ideas that can be used for that. So thank you very much. We I'm really happy and I think we feel really honored to have a view today here. Goodbye and have a have a good time and let's yeah let's let's hope that we can meet face to face soon again and have a coffee and discuss about the things we would like to talk about. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ignacio. Thank you. Be here. Thank you. Happy Good birthday, night. Ignacio. Go celebrate. Happy now. birthday. Yeah. Yes. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Okay. Happy. Okay. Bye. Thank, thank you. Bye.